in Speaking Volumes, thriller writer Mike Phillips, Laura Cumming of The Listener and broadcaster Russell Davis will be joining crime writer P.D. James to review a further selection of new books. And that's after an extended news at one o'clock with Moira Stewart. The Superpower Summit in Helsinki is underway. At the start of the first session of talks, President Gorbachev presented President Bush with a cartoon depicting the two men as joint victors of the Cold War. The Gulf crisis has dominated the first round of talks at the presidential palace in Helsinki. A spokesman for President Bush said the Soviet Union and the United States stood firm and together in seeking the enforcement of sanctions against Iraq. The Soviet Union described the three-hour talks as optimistic and constructive. The main burden of the Helsinki summit falls on George Bush. He called it, he travelled the furthest to get it. His are the troops facing Iraqi guns in the deserts of Saudi Arabia. At the start of his first session with the Soviet president, the two men appeared relaxed and friendly. How are you, sir? Both seemed ready to prove the new superpower relationship is more than just words. With Bush's delight, Mr. Gorbachev offered a cartoon showing the two leaders as prize fighters, jointly triumphing over the Cold War. Yet behind the smiles, both know this is diplomacy's hour in the Gulf crisis, as together they seek to coax or cajole Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait without using American firepower. With as many as 150,000 U.S. troops now committed on land and sea in the Gulf, America is impatient for a solution by any means, whatever it takes, Mr. Bush said. And as the First Lady toured the historical site, Mrs. Bush was asked if she was concerned for the welfare of soldiers in the Gulf. Of course we worry about the men and the women in the desert. Of course we do. And we worry about the children and everybody. If there is a secret agenda here, it could well be that President Bush will brief Mr. Gorbachev on when American patience will run out, leading to military intervention in the Gulf and seeking at least tacit Soviet acceptance. But publicly, when asked what success would be at the summit, all Mr. Bush is prepared to say is being sure that we are together. The two presidents emerged from this morning's talks in determined good humor, well aware that appearances are of vital importance at this summit, and clearly wanting to send a signal of superpower unity over the crisis in the Gulf. Mr. Gorbachev said their discussions had gone well, and Mr. Bush was quick to agree. The image of Presidents Gorbachev and Bush standing shoulder to shoulder will send an unmistakable message to Saddam Hussein. But for all the symbols of superpower solidarity, there are still significant differences between Moscow and Washington. Throughout today's comings and goings, Mr. Gorbachev has described himself as optimistic. But Soviet advisers here are hinting at resentment of American pressure to win Soviet acquiescence over the possible use of force in the Gulf, and arguing strongly that Washington must give diplomacy and sanctions more time to work before moving towards the military option. At a joint press briefing, the Americans emphasized the two sides' agreement on the need for an Iraqi withdrawal. The meeting focused almost entirely on the Persian Gulf situation, and we are united. But the Soviets were determined to stress that the way forward must be through UN diplomacy, not unilateral force. It was uh, very important that we manage uh, to engage in the situation, the uh, UN structures, uh, which will have uh, great uh, consequences for the world tomorrow. With agreement on the aims of superpower policy in the Gulf, the presidents this afternoon will have to address their differences over the means of achieving them. Martin Sixsmith, BBC News, Helsinki. Unconfirmed reports monitored on Kuwait radio say that three Iraqi soldiers have been executed for plotting to kill Saddam Hussein. The men were all said to be members of the elite presidential guard. In Iraq, the last major group of British hostages is preparing to leave on a flight to London. There are 240 British women and children waiting in the Al Rashid Hotel here for tonight's Iraqi jumbo jet charter direct to Gatwick. 
Iraqi officials say that the Britons will be joined at the airport by 170 American dependents who are flying up this afternoon direct from Kuwait. British diplomats believe that this is the last major evacuation of dependents to be sanctioned by the Iraqis, though arrangements can always be made for smaller groups and individuals to obtain exit visas. I understand that in the past 24 hours, up to 30 French men were moved from a Baghdad hotel to strategic installations by the Iraqi authorities, and a similar number of Britons have been moved in the same way on buses with the blinds down in the past 48 hours. This morning, there was a small anti-Western demonstration outside the British Embassy in Baghdad. Brian Barron, BBC News, Baghdad. In Britain, a Gulf crisis appeal has been launched by the Disasters Emergency Committee, which is asking for donations to help refugees stranded in Jordan. In London, hundreds of people are protesting against Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. There was a rally outside the Kuwaiti embassy, followed by a march. The organizers, the Free Kuwait Campaign, denounced the invasion as a naked act of aggression. There's been renewed fighting between rival Palestinian groups in southern Lebanon. Forces loyal to PLO leader Yasser Arafat have said they'll drive Abu Nudal's Fatah Revolutionary Council from the port city of Sidon. The fighting started on Friday and has so far left over 50 dead and 200 injured. Thousands of families are reported to have fled from the area. People left within the city have called a general strike to protest at the continued fighting in and around Sidon. The Ministry of Agriculture says it will consider a call to stop the export of live sheep to France. It's come from a former chairman of the Commons Agriculture, Com Agriculture Committee, Sir Richard Boddy, after the recent series of attacks on British lorries by French farmers. He says the time has come to stop exporting live animals. French farmers warn of revolution in the countryside. The British government calls it highway thuggery. In the past three months, French farmers have hijacked at least 19 lorry loads of imported livestock and meat, nearly all from Britain or Eastern Europe. Sheep have been burned alive or poisoned, the carcasses dumped. The French, suffering under plunging prices and two years of drought, want to stop the imports of cheaper meat they blame for driving their incomes further down. French authorities have promised to clamp down on the attacks, but farmers' leaders here, backed by some Conservative MPs and retailers, want immediate consumer action, a boycott of French imports. The leader of one consumer group says the subsidy system must change, and the export of live animals should stop altogether. I think anyone who's seen it at first hand and seen the way these animals are treated, uh, the way they're crammed into the lorries, the way they go for hundreds of miles without food and water and at the end have a barbaric slaughtering, would condemn it and say it should come to an end. But what we've got to do is to bring the subsidy system to an end, whereby we're paying out something like a thousand million pounds a year to farmers to produce uh, sheep which nobody wants to eat. And that's the news so far. We're back this evening at 6.25. Grandstand over on two in just over 15 minutes features golf from Sunningdale, live coverage of the Italian Grand Prix and racing from Curra. Sunday night on one finds Compo Clegg and Foggy taking tea. aren't much better at 7.45. I've got over a hundred thousand pounds worth of orders for that boat. I've got delivery dates. Then you'd better cancel them. If you renege on that contract, I'll sue you. The delivery of Aveline's baby is not without its problems at 8.35. Your stomach's all flabby. But Aveline, you've been going round like a beach ball for nine months. Now you know what happens when someone lets the air out. <laughs> Comedy and drama. Sunday night. On one. And now on one, we join P.D. James and her guests for a look at the latest in literary works in Speaking Volumes.